managed process of continuous innovation and systemic change in the direction of sustainability. So it's a pathway that we have towards sustainability. It's a process. It's about innovation. It's about change. <clears throat> and it's about changing the system uh, that we have. So those two terms, uh, those two expressions are important to get right in our heads, I think, at the outset when we are looking at this area of sustainable development, sustainability, and trying to explain the sustainable development goals. I'm sure many of you have seen this sorry, image. Sorry, Cliff, for interrupting. Uh, can I just check, are you sharing your slides? They're not coming through for me, but that might be just on They're my not side. coming through? Okay. Yep. Are they coming through now, Seamus? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Clifford. All right. Thanks very much, Seamus. Okay, so hopefully you have in front of you uh, a very well-known image, uh, which was taken by the astronauts in uh, the spaceship Apollo 17. It wasn't a planned photograph, but uh, one of the astronauts brought uh, an old SLR camera with them and took this photograph of planet Earth out of one of the port windows. And it was an image which is um, illustrative of our limited biosphere. It shows our planet uh, in the darkness of space, fragile and alone in, in a lifeless uh, solar system. We, we have to step away from our Earth in many ways before we can actually understand the, the limits that we have in terms of our soil, our, our water, and our atmosphere. As we live on the Earth, we, we find it very difficult to understand the notion of limits. This is the only home that we have. This is a, a planet which has sufficient resources if we manage them carefully. But unfortunately, for, for many years, we have not been managing our processes and our development in a way that uh, natural resources are sufficient for us to, to continue into the long-term future. I just want to give you the context in terms of our journey away from a sustainable systems. This is a, uh, an illustrative graph by Luke Malhauser, the impact of historical events on six measures of global well-being. And it goes back uh, a long period of time, a thousand years ago. And it looks at things like, you know, the life expectancy, which was very low over many years, and then increased as we have penicillin and we have uh, healthcare. Um, GDP and the uh, wealth generation we have, which was very low for very long periods of time, awful poverty, and then increases hugely. And all these improvements happen in the last 200 years, the Enlightenment and then the Industrial Revolution. We live longer, we're much wealthier. Uh, poverty and ill health has, has been... Um, managed much better in the last 100 years than it was in the previous 900. So we're, we're making great strides in terms of, of human development. But what this huge acceleration in, in well-being doesn't pick up is the impact which we are having on our natural systems. And one of the reasons why we have put so much pressure on the planet is the size of our population. So before the Industrial Revolution, we had somewhere in the region of a billion people. Today, we have 7.8 billion people on the planet. And that's one side of a coin. Population is, is a big pressure on the planet. The other side is consumption. What we consume in terms of 
the use of natural resources and then the pollution which arises from that and the wastes that we, we create. So more people consuming more products, more stuff has put significant pressure on the planet over time. And the first time that a scientific study identified this in, in a very clear way was this uh, seminal work, 1972, called The Limits to Growth. It was the first time that scientists had access to uh, large computing power. And Donella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, and others uh, working for the Club of Rome put in scenarios in terms of the extrapolation of, of the, the resource uses that were happening at the time, the industrial output that was happening at the time, population trends, uh, the expectations around food, ex expectations around pollution uh, because of industrial output. And this is the very famous graph which was created from the, the running of those scenarios. And it showed that population would peak sometime around um, 2020, 20, 2030, 20, and then decline. Industrial output would also peak. Resources would decline, and pollution would increase to a point that it would then, then decline after industrial output had declined. So this book was a, a wake-up call, along with other seminal works such as Silence Spring by Richard Carson. But it, it pointed out to our industrial model of continued expansion within a limited biosphere. And it led to thinking about trying to have a development process which was different to the straightforward economic expansion model that came out after the Second World War. And it was really after the Second World War when we pursued economic growth, um, largely to fix the huge issue of unemployment, that we saw increasing industrial, industrial processes damaging the environment. One of the best ways that we can identify how, how that happened and when it happened was the use of the science behind the ecological footprint. And this is a graph showing humanity's ecological footprint. So we all know Thinking, thinking back on the blue marble and the, the limited biosphere and the planet uh, that we live on, we only have one planet. So number of planet, planet Earths, one. Very obvious. But essentially in 1985 or so, we started um, moving to a position where we used resources from the planet that could not be replenished by nature. We started to put pollution into our rivers and into our atmosphere to such an extent that the, the natural circulatory processes couldn't deal with that pollution. And ever since, we have seen a situation where we are drawing down our natural capital, increasing our ecological footprint because of our increasing population and our increasing rates of consumption. So this single graph really picks up a lot of information in the context of sustainable development. You could put it in a simple way and say that below this green line, we are in a sustainable state, and above this green line, we are in an unsustainable state. Now, it, it is more complicated than that. Um, you, can, you can be um, somebody in a developing country who is very, very poor and the, the world doesn't feel anywhere uh, near a sustainable state for your personal experience. But on a global basis, we have a situation where we are exceeding the resources of the earth and the ability of the earth to cope with our wastes in the context of ecological footprints. David Holgram is the co-developer um, of the notion of permaculture, of permanent, permanent um, agriculture, per permanent design. And in his book in 2009 on future scenarios, he, he kind of summarized some of this information in, into a simplistic graph. It, it doesn't have any, any, any detail in terms of the, the vertical axis, but it's, it's the, the energy and resource use, our population increase and pollution and waste 
It's not dissimilar, I suppose, to that graph we saw uh, carried out by Donato and Dennis Meadows in the limits of growth. Over historical time, from pre-industrial societies, our population was small, our pollution was limited, and our energy use was also limited. All those elements increased over time as we embraced the Industrial Revolution, and particularly when we started to use fossil fuel. So fossil fuel, the use of coal and then oil has allowed population to increase, industrial production to increase, but also has meant pollution has increased, especially those related to greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And in his book, Future Scenarios, he talks about four ways we can, four expectations or, or four, four possible scenarios that we might have in our future. So he talks about the techno fantasy. So this is essentially a business as usual model. If we're wealthy now, if we see three, four percent growth every year based on fossil fuel, this is the point of the graph where we're just continuing that into the future. The second line is green tech stability. And I think green tech stability probably aligns best with um, the sustainable development goals and sustainability thinking uh, that derives from the United Nations and, and elsewhere. So we, we stabilize our energy use, we stabilize population. That's, that will probably happen anyway as becoming wealthier. But in, very importantly, we stabilize pollution and waste. And we, we flatten off the curve and we try and get it back down below the, the, that line in the ecological footprint of the use of the warm climate. Holgram then also um, talks more negatively in terms of his scenario building. He talks about creative descent or earth stewardship, where we see a, a managed but considerable drop in global population, considerable drop in energy use, and a return to much simpler times. And then the final a scenario is, is essentially a, a Malthusian scenario where we have a huge crash in population and a reversal of, of the Industrial Revolution and, and return to sort of dystopian, sort of a dystopian future. So I, I think if we look at the top two, this is the unsustainable future that we are probably um, moving away from to an extent because hopefully we are starting to follow this green path of green tech stability and uh, following the, the ideas around sustainable development towards sustainability. Coming from the Limits to Growth report and the concern about the environment and non-government organizations coming together to raise concerns about pollution and species uh, loss and so on, there were several attempts to bring a new approach to development onto the international agenda. And this was the, 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 the first time that it was successfully done. In 1987, the United Nations, um, under the uh, chairmanship of Gro Harlan Brundtland, brought forward this report and recommendations called Our Common Future. It was a report of the World Commission on Environment and Development. And in 1987, you can essentially say that sustainable development was mainstreamed as a concept. But within that um, document and within that initiative, there was a recognition that global development essentially had become unsustainable. So by the very term, sustainable development means that the model to that point needed to be corrected. So this kicked off the process. And as part of that report, there was a recommendation that there would be a world summer, summit of all the leaders. And that happened in Rio in 1992. The United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, the Rio Earth Summit 22. And there were three particular um, international agreements that were forged there, signed off, and the ambitions were, were high, and the hopes were also high when that summit met in 92. In 2002, 10 years later, um, the United Nations met again in Johannesburg. 
And essentially, the world leaders, guided by the United Nations and the technical experts, noted that all the, 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 the ambitions and the, the high hopes 10 years previously had not been met. And that there was um, very little done in terms of progress on environmental protection. But it laid the work for the very important and very successful Millennium Development Goals. These goals set at the uh, time of the Millennium 2000, set targets out to 2015. There were eight targets and the targets were around eradicating extreme poverty and hunger, achieving universal primary education, promoting gender equality, empowering women, reducing child mortality, improving maternal health, combating HIV and AIDS, ensuring environmental sustainability and a global partnership for development. And probably to the surprise of most participants, given the commitments that were given in Rio, these Millennium Development Goals were actually very successful. So they were in train from 2000 to 2015. But just after they had been agreed, the world leaders 20 years after Rio came back and they came back to Rio again and they had another conference. They said after 20 years from the first Rio, very, very, again, a lot of issues have, have not been successful. But it laid out the, the framework for what became the Sustainable Development Goals. They noted in 2012 that great progress was being made from the Millennium Development Goals and that governments, citizens, institutions, businesses seem to be better able to achieve environmental protection and social equity if there were goals in place. So while Rio plus 20, when it finished, there was a, a, another sense of, well, what happened there? But what happened actually was the foundation was laid in the context of the success of the Millennium Development Goals to construct the Sustainable Development Goals for 2015 to 2030. And these, these are the goals which were realized from that 2012 uh, summit. So these 17 goals are global goals. They are the global goals for sustainable development. And hopefully at this stage, I've given you sufficient context. And I can now give you a little bit more detail in relation to these goals. The 17 goals and the introduction is as follows. The sustainable development goals are a set of 17 goals for the world's future. And the time frame is from 2015 to two, 2015 to 2030. Important fact is that they are backed up by a set of 169 detailed targets, far, far too much detail to go into in, in a short session like this. But there is flesh on the bones to these broad goals in the targets. It took two years for them to be negotiated by the United Nations, came from um, Rio Plus 20 and launched in September uh, 2015. Agreed by nearly all the world's nations on the 25th of September. I suppose something which is encouraging, especially in the current political climate and, and the controversy when the United States came out of the Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, the United States didn't come out of the Sustainable Development Goals. And I, I think there's something about the way that the goals were crafted that allowed everybody to buy into them and to stay committed to them. So they've been, so far, very successful in unifying people with the intention of delivering these over this 15 year period. So what is new and different about the 17 Sustainable Development Goals? The first thing is that they apply, the goals apply to every nation, every sector, to cities, to businesses, to schools, organizations, we're all challenged to act. And this is the notion of universality. 
So it's not just for the nation states to do something in relation to poverty, uh, you know, the developed countries helping the less developed countries. It's not about um, big government programs. These goals apply to businesses. They apply to institutes of education. They apply to government departments. They're universal. They apply to citizens. So universal, universality in, in, in its makeup is one characteristic. The second is it's recognized that the goals are all interconnected in a system. And essentially, the system that we have uh, is unsustainable. It has taken 200 years to get to this point of crisis, if, if you want to call that, especially in relation to climate change. And we need a systemic approach to fix these complex issues that we have. So we cannot aim to achieve just one goal. We must achieve them all. And this is called integration. And finally, it's widely recognized that achieving these goals involves making very big fundamental changes in how we live on Earth. And this is called transformation. So the transformation element is that we, not only do we need to change our businesses and our transport, we need to change our financial systems, we need to change our educational systems, we need to change the way that we do business because the, the system is, is fundamentally broken in the context of the problems that we have. To bend that curve in the context of our planetary ecological footprint is going to take systemic transformation. So we can take a tour. There's 17 goals. Some would say 17 goals are too many, but I think you know it's, 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 it's not overly difficult for us to, to get to grips with them. Uh, and the first one is, is very reflective of the Millennium Development Goals because in many ways, it's, it's one of the most important goals. Goal number one is to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. Now you can read down into more detailed text and into the targets, but I think we know what this means. It means that we can't have a sustainable world if a billion people every night go to bed hungry. If we have very, very poor people who earn less than a dollar fifty cent per day, there is no incentive for those people to reduce the size of their families. And that might seem like a strange uh, topic to bring up, but essentially, if people are very, very poor, if they don't have um, health care, if they don't have the ability for people to look after themselves when they're, they get old. Uh, if they don't have the means for uh, labor for subsistence agriculture, the survival mechanism is to have a large family. And we're not too far off understanding that uh, in, in our own modern history in, in Ireland, where large families were the norm. As people get out of extreme poverty, family size comes down, and that sorts out one of the issues on that coin in terms of population. So apart from the, the ethical and the, the moral issue of people being in absolute poverty, there's also the issue of it being a means to have less impact on the earth with, with very uh, impoverished and, and poor people. So it is, it is a crucial goal and much progress has been made. So end poverty in all its forms everywhere. Goal number two is uh, linked. Um, linking of the goals is goes throughout the 17. End hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. So sustainable agriculture will look very different in Ireland than it will look in Sierra Leone. But many of the principles um, can, can be the same. It is about having sufficient food for people it with a healthy diet to give them a healthy lifestyle. So food security on this planet is something which can, can be achieved and achieved without um, enormous um, barriers if we are focused on the issue and, 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 and work collectively towards it.
Goal number three is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. So this, this resonates with people as well in terms of the health um, that people should enjoy, not only in the rich countries in the developed world, but in those countries where access to, to, to medical care uh, is, is far less um, reliable. And we're seeing this issue, this, this goal is relevant to this, this strange time we're living in at the moment in the global pandemic. Ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. It's a big challenge, but it's something um, that, that is uh, realizable with, with sufficient focus. Goal number four, ensure inclusive and quality education for all and promote lifelong learning. For many other issues around the sustainable development goals, um, education is, is crucial. Education is seen as is vital at the primary level, um, should be required at secondary level, becomes a luxury to an extent at third level for some developing countries, but it is through education that people can, can move into, into better, um, to better lives and expectations. And education should not just be the preserve of the rich, or it shouldn't just be the reserve of, of males. It needs to be available to both genders across all countries. Goal number four, achieve gender equality and empower women and girls. This, this is a, a, a goal which can be used essentially, I suppose, uh, in countries where it's a long way from being achieved as a means by which uh, non-governmental organizations, citizens, groups can point to it and say, look, you have signed up to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Currently, there is gender inequality in my country, wherever it might be. What are you doing about it? So it, it is a sort of a peer relationship with all the countries around the world. Some have gender equality, some do not. And it is maybe a goal that would be more difficult to achieve in some of the, the world's countries. But by having it in there and by the focus that it gives, it gives great ambition to try and have a much more equal, equitable um, world between, between the genders. Goal number six, ensure access to water and sanitation for all. Um, if we look at the statistics that come from the United Nations, we can see that um, access to clean water is a huge issue. And access to a toilet for people in developing countries is, is, a, is a real challenge. So this looks at ensuring access to water and sanitation for all, for everybody. So there, there's, a, there's a, a great ambition in that, especially in, in developing countries. Number seven, ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. This obviously links to the climate change issue because we need essentially, if we're going to have a sustainable world, to move away from fossil fuel. Fossil fuel allowed us to have this huge level of growth. It has brought us all sorts of benefits, but its byproduct of greenhouse gases, of CO2 in particular, is uh, raising the temperature in the earth and giving us global warming. So we need to transition across quickly and in, in, in a substantial way towards sustainable energy. Energy efficiency, renewable energy, and making that available for all. It is interesting to see some countries in the majority south, maybe I should use that term, um, not even considering going down the route that uh, countries in the north have used in terms of um, huge power stations and distributed uh, electricity grids. They're looking at uh, localized grids with uh, local power from wind or from solar and uh, moving straight towards renewable energy. And in the pandemic, uh, the one sector that has, has never really taken its foot off the, the, the accelerator has been the development of renewable energy right across the globe. Number eight, promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth 
employment and decent work for all. The notion of sustainable economic growth for some sustainable development purists might, might make them a little bit um, uncomfortable, but I think to an extent, the debate about growth or no growth has, has moved on. And I think the more relevant issue about growth or no growth is what type of growth do we want? If we can have growth that promotes renewable energy, waste recycling, a circular economy, that type of growth is good. If we have growth for plastic toys that we throw out after a week, that type of growth is much more questionable. It's, it's not good. So inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment and decent work for all. Number nine, build resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Encouraging developments over the last uh, days and weeks in terms of money being budgeted in Ireland towards uh, cycleways, in, in terms of looking at infrastructure that allows for less car journeys. So there are opportunities to move away from our fossil fuel transport system. There's opportunities and, and there are developments to move away from our energy system being fueled by, by oil and coal and gas and moving towards wind and solar and wave. Number 10, reduce inequality within and among countries. Anybody who I think fairly assesses sustainable development and issues around sustainability will agree with the, the, the author of The Green Economy, a man called Michael Jacobs. And he wrote about sustainable development having an inescapable commitment to equity, an inescapable commitment to equity. Equity is fairness. So fairness within our country, between people, between our country and other countries, and between our generation and other generations. Intergenerational equity and intragenerational equity. Fairness in terms of access to resources now and in the future. Number 11, make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Um, for maybe rural dwellers like myself, uh, who, <laughs> who don't venture into the city all that often, um, no, very happy to get back down to the country. But it, we are now an urban planet. The majority of the population on planet Earth now live in cities. So we have got to deal with the challenge of making these cities sustainable. And if the goal on infrastructure is, is implemented correctly, we can have um, sustainable transport systems. We can have district heating systems. We can have food systems within the city and cities can can be places of resilience and sustainability with the right type of design. Number 12, ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. So again this needs some thinking about. Um, the type of consumption that we have maybe we need to to redefine. So consumption for many is consumption of consumer products. So it's, it's clothes, it's holidays perhaps, it's, it's uh, white goods, it's cars. But consumption can also be about consuming um, the benefits of community development, the benefits of working within uh, wild, wild, uh, wildlife preserves, the benefits of uh, good healthcare, the benefits of consumption of the development element of sustainable development, the non-monetary elements. Number 13, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals came out in September of 2015, and hot on its heels, the people who left in September knew that uh, they would be heading for Paris uh, in December for the Paris Climate Change Agreement. So the, the, the back end of, of 2015 work was an enormous year for the whole area of sustainable development. So all those other issues, especially in terms of the goal on sustainable energy, is absolutely crucial to combat climate change. We need to change our consumption patterns, but we need to change the way 
the products that we get for consumption are made and where that fuel comes from. So th this, this goal in its own right uh, has essentially a, a whole parallel process uh, beside it. Number 14, conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources. I think most people who are maybe logged in tonight uh, will, will probably have seen the, uh, the, the great work uh, uh, done by Sir David Attenborough and his highlighting of plastic pollution and the pressure we're putting on our oceans. Pollution from plastics and, and other, you know, uh, other, other substances, overfishing of the seas, acidification because of increased levels of CO2. These issues are, 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 are hugely problematic and need to be dealt with. And while we have the issues in the oceans, we also know they are on land too. We need to sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, halt and reverse land degradation, and halt biodiversity loss. Much of the, the um, training, the education that we give on our environmental degrees in LIT and Thurlis is focused on, on the tools to do this job around sustainable resource management, around looking at biodiversity uh, studies, habitat studies, and trying to manage the, the, the natural environment in a sustainable way. This is a huge issue for, for all of us, whether we are in a maritime climate, in the west, edges of Europe or whether we're in, in a desert nation in, in, in uh, North Africa. Number 16, promote just, peaceful and inclusive societies. So this is a, the, the sort of the social element of it and of course the, you know, the, the starting point of sustainable development are the three elements of the environment, the economy and society. The three have to be balanced and we need to have um, justice and equity within society and a sharing of resources and mechanisms, mechanisms by which dialogue comes, uh, comes naturally in, in a supportive environment. Number 17, revitalize, and this is the last goal, revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. So the United Nations isn't perfect. The Irish government isn't perfect. Um, LIT isn't perfect. And none of us have all the answers, but we can make the commitment to try and work together in partnership, to learn from our mistakes and to try and have sufficient funds at the global level that feed into these processes and support them. So, Goals maybe for some people work well in terms of they have a tick list. And it seems even at the global level, goals have focused minds. And that's what these goals are about. They're essentially goals to try and help us to bend the curves back towards sustainability. Each goal is important by itself, but they're all connected. There's an interaction between all of them. And as I said, our system is essentially unsustainable and we need broad based systemic change if we are to, to alter the path of development towards sustainability into the long term. Our 17 sustainable development goals are not just a challenge for national government. They're not just a challenge for the United Nations. It's not just a process for bureaucrats and civil servants. It's a commitment that businesses need to, to square up to. It is a, a set of goals that each academic institution, university, school, club, society need to think about. And I must say I was very encouraged um, the year before last when I went to the National Planning Championships just to see the level of engagement by the government departments on the sustainable development goals. They were up front and center in all of their promotional stands and the literature. I think we're starting to see a sea change in, in commitment by, by uh, those in positions of influence to try and make these goals happen here in Ireland as well. I'm gonna finish with this short video. Um, it's put together by uh, the United Nations, but it has some very famous uh, uh, personalities in it. See if you can count off all, all, all the people that you recognize talking about the sustainable development goals. 
I'm hoping that the audio will come through. Seamus, if it doesn't, you might let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can fix it. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. We, we will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. When no one goes hungry. When no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We will live in a world when no child has a diet. Diseases we know how to cure. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if the world is We will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and abroad. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone, heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where economies prosper. A new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industries our infrastructure and our best innovations are not just used to make money, but to all make all our lives better. better. We live in the world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated inside our countries and between different countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe, and progressive, and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume, planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back from climate, climate change. Where we restore and protect the, the life, life in our, our oceans, oceans and seas. We <laughs> restore and protect life on land, the forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. Where all countries and we their people work together in partnerships of all kinds to make these global goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations global goals for sustainable development. Let's, Let's get, get to work. work. Let's make it happen. Okay, Seamus, um, I wasn't able to hear the audio on that, but I, I think uh, this is, we're, we're finished now, so if there's any, any questions or, or discussion that's wanted, we can take it now. Great. Thanks very much, Clifford, um, and for that, that great uh, presentation and taking us through both, both the background, through the, the SDGs and the um, an insight to them all also. Um, we do have one question, question that's been posted by one of the participants there is, I suppose, looking at what are the, the greatest barriers or obstacles to change? Um, you know, are these kind of barriers posed by kind of political entities, kind of capitalist entities, or is it public engagement? Have you a view on that? Um, yeah, well, I have a view and this is not the LIT position, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a government position or anything like that, but I, th I think the people are well ahead of um, some of the, not so much the policy makers, but some of the people in, in power, perhaps. I think a, a, a barrier are the vested in interests. So essentially, if, if, we're, if you're thinking back on David Holgram's graph of what he called techno-fantasy, techno-fantasy is the business as usual situation. So the business as usual are the fossil fuel companies. The business as usual are the businesses in the brown economy that are making lots of money. 
and the ones that are reluctant to move away into uh, the green economy and more sustainable systems. So I, I think resistance um, in the last 20 or 30 years has been both political from maybe more conservative politicians who don't want to see this type of change and vested interests. I think the people uh, are probably a good bit further ahead. I'll give you an example. I met a, 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 a dean of a very large university from Phoenix, Arizona. And this, uh, this dean had something like 40,000 students uh, in, the, in his university. And he said he obviously doesn't know an awful lot of the students and he, they were on all sorts of different courses in the arts and engineering and uh, finance and so on. But he said he got a sense from all of them in conversations and discussion that they knew that fundamentally there was something wrong with the type of development um, that was currently underway. They couldn't articulate it. They, they didn't have the language of sustainable development, sustainability, but they knew fundamentally that the system that we have in terms of the consumerist model continued growth in a finite world, that there was, there, was, there was something up with that model and that it would have to change. So I think the citizens, I think the, 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 the think, thinking people um, are probably ahead of some of the vested interests and the more conservative politicians. Okay, thanks. I suppose a question from from myself to you, maybe just or for for your opinion. And um, you know, we had a government policy around the whole uh, the aspect of education for sustainable development, and that the education system should look at how it can integrate sustainable development in in what we do, both you know all the way through the education system, not just at the third level. Um, I mean, it, it seems to me that that policy needs to be revisited now. Um, it's, it's, you know, effectively out of date now and need, needs needs a, a new look. Um, if you were the the minister um, and had the opportunity to look at it, what what have you any thoughts on new ways or new approaches or ideas that could be taken to, to integrate the whole issue of and topic of sustainable development into our education system? That's an awfully big question, James. Absolutely. I have to finish <laughs> um, on the hard yeah. one. <laughs> um, I, I, I think if, if as Minister for Education, I, I would, I would tear, out, tear out the first couple of chapters from most economics textbooks. I, I think that would be a good starting place because the business as usual model of just consumerism and continued economic growth is fundamentally flawed. Um, we, we don't get that. I think we need an education system that gets pupils from a young age starting to, to question the unsustainable system that we have and ask questions why that's the case. So it's not a growth, no growth argument. I think we need to, to be more refined in the questions that we ask about the type of growth. So if we're looking at a business that produces um, a product using um, fossil energy and the product ends up in the bin um, a week after it's been purchased. That, that type of economic model needs to be fund fundamentally be rethought. So I think it's, it's, it's uh, well, I'll, I'll finish by, by say, saying something that um, I, I came across recently. We, a fundamental of the education system, which we, we don't get across, is the, the simple fact uh, around the, the second law of therm thermodynamics. I know that might sound complicated, but we have to respect these, um, the, the limitations that we have on a finite planet. We have to change the mindset of people to understand there's only so much soil, so much water, so much atmosphere. And we need to change in a complex system from using fossil fuel to renewable energy and to change the type of economic model that we have. So I think educational systems that get, get people thinking about the big questions is, is a fundamental. So maybe they should do a little bit of philosophy. Maybe they should, should do a little bit of um, systems thinking in, in their educational um, uh, journey from, from the earliest age right through to, to, to the, the, the higher levels.
Great, thanks very much. Uh, two other comments, kind of questions have come in. So um, from Avin, uh, just a question in terms of uh, the SDGs, are there consequences for countries if um, their level of contribution or attainment of the SDGs is not what it should be by 2030? It's a good question. Um, I'm don't I don't have a, 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 a clear answer to that question, but my understanding is this: my understanding is that they are um, they are goals that are not tied into say uh, t they're, they're not targets and, and they they they, are, they don't have penalties assigned to them if they aren't met. So because they're global goals and because they're kind of universal in, in their, their ambition, they are about trying to bring people on board to achieve them. Uh, and it's, they're much more carrot than stick. So my understanding is, and, and I could be wrong, I don't think there are um, mechanisms to tie people in to achieve them specifically. They're much more about the encouragement of, of working together to achieve these goals uh, in a sort of a universal fashion. In a, in a universal way. Okay, I suppose a, a comment more than a, and a question just from uh, Marianelle is that um, from her perspective is that the, the, the larger corporations need to take the big steps and then that the, the people um, are ready and willing to follow. Um, so any, any... Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that, yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, you know, I, I think um, there, there is, there's cause to be hopeful and, and to be optimistic in many ways that uh, as long as you're careful to try and see through what can be called greenwash, but it's, it's not just the advertising of, of the green, green sort of sheen on products, so big corporations are, are starting to move in this direction. And I think part of it, is, is around what consumers expect. I think the, the younger generation who will be brought up with the sustainable development goals in their education system and who have gone through the green schools um, uh, programs in their national schools, they're, they're probably far more discerning in terms of what they consume and their attitude to the environment than perhaps our generation um, who, who didn't have this type of of thinking or, or background. So yes, I, I'd agree. Corporations in many ways are the ones who should be leading this. They have the money to do it. And they're the biggest culprits in terms of some of the big global issues. So um, that, that, is, that is a very good place to start. Okay. Um, I'm going to finish it up there. Uh, just to say thanks very much, Different again for taking your time out, both for preparing and uh, delivering your, your talks this evening. Thanks everybody for joining us. And thanks again to uh, Science Foundation Ireland and the, as part of the Tipperary Festival of Science and Mary I for our co cooperation with them. We'll be um, posting the video from tonight and from the last two nights on Tuesday, we, we spoke about climate leadership. And last night we had a presentation talking about the use of games for uh, engaging youth in the, the topic of climate action. Um, so, and we'll send the details of where you can see those um, to everybody tomorrow and hopefully you'll have a chance to, to share those. And maybe if you need to, to look back and capture any information, you'll be able to do that. So thanks very much everybody and stay safe. Take care. Thanks for it, James.